<laughs> right there, right in there. Oh, okay. And that and was it, a bunker, like a well, I mean, it, you know, the city was there, and they had they uh, had uh, kind of uh, dug out, or and then they had a bunker there, and we went top. You dumped the garbage, and they had the truck back in there. Huh. And you know, they and after when the truck got filled up, he took it out to Goleta to the hog farm. And it was so, a transfer station. It was. Huh? That's what it was. <laughs> yeah. This is the I, every time I go, I still can re Now they've sloped it off. It's all city parking. It's a city property. I'll drive by there and, and show you. you yeah, know. I'd like to know where it is. The yeah. address. So uh, that's, we would do that until I was telling him that uh, my brother, of course, he always was thinking, uh, you know, like, why should we be giving this food away, this garbage away, let's get our own hogs. Yeah. So then, uh, see, uh, that's how we uh, got started that. In fact, for a while we were bringing, uh, giving the garbage to a fellow up on Coyote Road, you know, to get rid of our garbage. Yeah. Hey. To so be, we, had a, we had an open truck, like you see, an open state truck. And in the front of the truck, we had six 55-gallon, those oil drums. Mm -hmm. So when you went up into to pick up the trash or the garbage, you put the garbage into these oil, big oil drums, yeah. and you put your trash behind. Then when you got to the, when you got to the dump, with a fork, you forked off the papers and the trash and then the garbage was in the drums then you you either fed it, fed it to our own hogs or to begin with and actually all of that part was before I even was with my brother I just used to work for him and go with him we I went in with my brother and I worked for him in the summers 34 35 and then I went in with him business with him in January of 37, because I graduated from high school in 36. Mm -hmm. So then I went in business with him in 37. Were you doing anything in the 20s? Any trash? Oh, my brother started, he was still in high school. He, he finished high school in 1929, and he had just a Model T Ford, and he had a couple of barrels in the back, and he used to go to two or three places, and to make a few extra bucks, you know. Yeah. So. Uh, okay, so that was 1930. It was the early 30s when you started. Oh, I started. I business. started in Jan. I started actually in business with him in January of 1937. I started, but I worked for him. I I drove. The, I worked for him like all the summer of 35 and all the summer of 34. Mm -hmm. You know, is when I worked for him. You know. Can you tell us more about the types of stuff that people were throwing away? I know you said there was garbage. Was yeah, there was garbage. The and all the what, nor what about all the other stuff? What normally, sure, all the other stuff. Yeah. You know, whether it be bottles and paper and cans and uh, flour. You know, from from the from the house. You know, anything that came out of the household. So it's relatively simple, though, compared to what we throw away today, right? Well, there was no shrink wrap in there. No one shrink wrap. You didn't see plastic children's. Toys. No, 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 right? no, no, nothing like that. No, yeah. So bottles and oh, sure, cans Bot and paper. bottles and papers and cans and you know rags. Yeah, and anything that came out of the house. You know, Did you think if the if the fellow from. Uh, the chauffeur up there, if he had a can of other things, he'd bring it down separate, but uh, primarily you just took what came out of the house. No garden stuff, you know. When, so do you think people had less trash back then? Because oh, no, so not, of these, not of these big, these big estates. It would be nothing to go to uh, and, uh, and get uh, a 32-gallon container full of... Uh, a household of uh, uh, garbage, because they did entertaining. You know these big estates like the Napa Estate, big estate up there, the Peabody's Estate, 
we went to and uh, Nixon there and uh, McGann up there, T.C. Walker, you know. And actually, T.C. Walker in the summertime, I always had a big family. They would have two 32-gallon cans, and you picked up Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday on the, those big places. We had two... We had two estates that you went every day. The McCormick Estate, Stanley McCormick Estate, you went every day, six days a week. And Mrs. Slater up there in East Valley, for some reason or other, she she wanted it uh, picked up every day, six days a week. Wow. $15 a month. And that was all food and everything uh, else? And they came out of the house. Everything. Everything came out of the house. A lot of flowers. You know, they uh, they decorated, you not decorated, but they used a lot of flowers in the house. Anything that came out of the house. Yeah. But as I say, there was a, might have been, uh, well, like the Slater Sr. and the General Babbitts, there are a few, pl uh, there are a few places that they got rid of their own papers. They would burn their papers. And then once a year or twice a year, they save. You know, come and pick up the cans and bottles. Mm -hmm. All you picked up was the food scraps mm -hmm. from the kitchen, you know. And there was two places that I used to go up the end of the house, like Oakley Thorns was a big place. You went up the big back porch where they fix the flowers. You got the flower can. You went into the kitchen. You got the garbage can. And uh, you went into the pantry, got their can. But in the interim, of course, they when they fill up, they had their other big containers, but you went up into the house. Mm -hmm. And then another thing we did, a lot of, you lined, you lined their garbage cans. By that I mean you got newspaper, you got a newspaper, you put the newspaper and you line the garbage cans. For the food. For the food. The garbage, you need food. And if you didn't line the can, you always put a paper on the bottom of the can so that the garbage wouldn't stick to the bottom. Oh, yeah. And then there's some places yeah. periodically, you know, maybe once a week if the can start got smelly, you wash the can for them. You wash the garbage can yeah. for them. Yeah. Okay. So, so this, you're talking about the 30s. The yeah, I'm talking the about the 30s. 30s. I'm then, talking about the 30s right up to the, you know, the, the, the war time, and then that's when everybody, of course, cut back, yeah. you know, the 30s. But you yeah. used this steak side truck until oh yeah until, until, the until early about 40s. 1960 I think oh. we've seen that picture of all those trucks back there and then we got the first Packer truck and when was that 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 was in about the early 60s you remember that first Packer truck that we got it was in uh, a Chevrolet it was a 19 uh, it was a 1958 Chevrolet was the first compacted truck that. Uh, that uh, that we got it was used. No, it was brand new. Brand new Chevrolet it was too too big a heavy of a box for the size of the truck. That, yeah. that, that's correct, and it. Uh, yeah. But but that was the first compactor truck uh, yeah. that we that we purchased. 1958. And prior to that, it was all over the top. Open steak trucks. Open steak truck. That's why yeah, today sometimes in the I can hardly walk. We used to lift that stuff over the top. Yeah. And there was there was no... Well, let's go back a step. When the county, see, there was as many... We had four different haulers, even like in the Montecito area. And some of them went into Hope Ranch. We didn't go. So it was competitive, you know, four haulers. This was in the 50s or 40s? Four, that was in the 30s. Oh, okay. Until the county and some of the haulers, their trucks was, uh, let's say, you know, I don't want to get into, you know, some of the trucks were dilapidated trucks. Their helpers, if we can commonly use the word, they get a wino, hey, come on, give us a hand. Be a top man. They put them up on top. So they'd hand them up the stuff, you know. And uh, so that everything and uh, was like uh, all competitive, but the county had no control over it. 
fact that a couple of times the, the highway patrol even stopped the trucks and because they were so, you know, the trucks with their brakes and the whole thing that uh, it was just the repair, you know, that, uh, that they were going around. So the county says we're going to put restrictions. If you want to stay in business, you have to get a permit. And yeah, you know, your truck's going to have to be covered. Your men, you know, they're, you're not going to be able just to get anybody to work for you. In other words, have a respectable. It was a typical, hey, there goes a garbage truck, you know. When was that? When did they start? And they, it they, I don't know, the county could look it up. I guess they started that in the, it was the 60s. The, 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 the county started the permit process that's, yeah, the permit in 1960, process. and then that's when this whole concept of zones took place in the Santa Barbara County in the 60s. And that's when the county was, was so, spoke, so to speak, uh, yeah. chopped up in these various zones. Yeah. And these various zones still exist today with the exception of yeah. Cuyama and, um, and what we call uh, Route 154, the San Marcos Pass. And, all the way to Paradise Road and the Trout Club, and for some reason, we uh, we inherited those. But uh, at any event, that's when all of this zone business started. Yeah. Well, we when we, when they zoned it, we had uh, Montecito, Hope Ranch, Mission pa pa Parts of it. Parts of it. Parts of what? Montecito. No, well, we had we. You had didn't a, have all of Montecito. Well, when they when they put down the zone. Oh, they, when they made the zones when prior they made to the, the zones. Th well, prior to the zone, well, you everybody picked up where they wanted it, but as long as it was in the district. But then, when they zoned it, that's when they gave half of our business in Goleta. Remember, they went down. They made the zone. When when you went in the city of Goleta, we had everything. Above Hollister Avenue till Patterson. Went out there. Remember, we had there where David that, lived. And that's right, and those same. We went down and then went down Patterson, and then they gave this the other company, which is now still their area. They had the one side of Patterson. As you went down, we had the left, they had the right. Then you went down, down through Hollister Avenue. Which is still today, they have the right hand side of Goleta and we have the left hand side, which we still have today. And that still exists today. Still exists today, all the way out to Elwood. We had the, the El Encanto track, we had Isla Vista, and they had the north. And remember, then it came up to where it ended up there, to going up to, uh, up to the canyon where Winchester Canyon. Winchester Canyon, when, power that, when that came up. Discussion came up, well, where's the dividing line? And I remember going out there and said, well, the dividing line are going to be these power lines. And then we had everything above that. Clear out to Ga clear out to Gavio. To Gavio. And that still exists today, doesn't it? Yeah, these zones are, these, these zones are coming up on, uh, on, on 50, yeah. on, on, on 50 years. I didn't know yeah. that. Yeah. And that was channel disposal back then, right? Yeah, right. well, first it was Borgatello Brothers. It was my brother and I. Okay. And then when we wanted to incorporate, so to have, have a corporation for the, you know, you get under, which made it good for, as you know, with corporation, we incorporated into, uh, into uh, channel. channel disposal company. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can you tell us about the... The pig farm, where it was located, how many pigs you had, and oh yeah, well naturally we started out just with the uh, what forty, fifty pigs. The hog farm was in San Antonio Creek Road. You could either get to San Antonio Creek Road from Tucker's Grove, down there, or from up in the San Marcos Pass, right past the San Antonio Bridge. There, you made a left. Well, the road is still there, and that's a different road. But anyway, we went down there, and our place was right on top of the hill there. We had 10 acres there. And no, no water, 
We drilled our own well, got very little water, but when we went up there, we had a haul of water, and that's where we started our pigs. Because, as I said before, my brother and I, we were giving the garbage away, so he said, well, why not get our own place? So then the pig farm really got to be quite a operation is when the marine base came to town, or came to Goleta, then uh, my brother had gone in the service and I was still taking care of the small pig farm and the business, and we got the contract to get the food scraps, to get the garbage from the marine base, which is right there where UCSB is. When was, what year was that? Uh, well, that was, uh, let's see, 1940, let's see, 41, the war broke, 1942. Mm -hmm. See, the war broke out in December of 41, and then things really started to break open, you know, and they started that, build that marine base. They started right down there where the airport is now, and then the, they started, they built that the base up there where the personnel, and of course, what it was, was a, it was a marine air station. That was uh, where they're, they're training the fighter pilots and that were going overseas. Yeah. So you were collecting food scraps? Just garbage food scraps, yeah, and food that basically. built up to about, we, we were running about 500 head of pigs wow. up to the peak. Oh, San Antonio. We were shipping a load of hogs a month. And of course, we had somebody was shipping them to Los Angeles. How many is in a load? Well, the government wanted the pigs or heavy, so we would keep them to about 300, 350 pounds, and uh, oh, depending, you know, maybe be 30, 25, 30. Every month? Every month. Wow. Every month. So yeah. how many truck loads, how many trips did you take from your routes up to the hog farm every day? Well, I used to go at the Marine base every day, twice a day. Go about seven in the morning and go to pick up you know, the, the garbage and then go up late in the afternoon after the evening meal. Mm -hmm. So my day started, say, about seven o'clock till seven or eight until I got finished because I picked up the garbage and I used to come on and feed the hogs. But you were doing all the route, too. Well, I had you one had man. I had customers. one man working for us. Okay. One man was taking care of the route out there in Montecito. And then we were able to, we cut back and the people went for it. As I mentioned, we were picking up. People had either twice a week service, three times a week service was the norm. Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday. And then some of them wanted Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday. But I told you there was exceptions. We had two people. We had to go every day. But when the war came along, they were all for it. We started only we, twice a week would only go to, you know, because we were limited to our people working. Yeah. And, uh, of course, we could get everything was rationed as far as the gasoline and tires, but we had no problem in getting what we needed to take care of that. Yeah. So you still had at that time six barrels on the back of the truck? It was six barrels. I used to go at the Marine base. I used to go with, I had a, a pickup, but I used to carry six barrels on it and I used to fill those every time I would go there. To the top? To the top, oh yeah. To the top and over top. And how many times did you actually empty those at the pig farm per day? Just twice. Twice, okay. Go in the morning and then go in the afternoon to the marine. That's including your, your guy that was on the route, too. Well, he didn't pick up that much in those, you know. I mean, he was lucky if he picked up maybe two barrels, you know. Oh, okay. You know, he wasn't, he wouldn't, uh, and the people had cut back, too, you know. There was no more of these big parties, you know, that they were doing. and Everybody cut back, let's put it that way, you know. Yeah. And so... So, uh, can you tell us what you think are the similarities between garbage or just the whole trash waste stream now and the early years? Are there any similarities that you... Well, I mean, you still have the... Well, the thing is, you're, 
you can't tell because now you have the garbage disposal. Even even take a place like the Biltmore, they they put in, you know, big garbage disposal, you know. And then uh, remember, to, he used to go with me and go to the Biltmore or the Miramar, you know. And they, of course, they had a lot of garbage, you know. Now the similarity, uh, you know, I can't relate to it, you know, because uh, they don't pick up the wet garbage like they used to, like I understand that you people want to get back to doing. You take like a place like the Biltmore, you'd pick up two and two or three in a weekend, two or three of those big barrels of wet garbage, you know, at one time. San Ysidro Ranch, you know, they did a, a lot of, you know, entertaining and there was a lot of wet garbage now. I don't know what it's going to be now when they start. I, I imagine they're still uh, a lot of wet garbage that comes out of it, but they put in these big commercial garbage disposals, and that's where it, it goes all down here to your your sewer plant. Yeah. Well, well you know, if, you just, uh, go ahead, Mark. Uh, if, if I might just comment on that briefly, uh, they don't they don't put uh, food scraps down the garbage disposal anymore at these large institutions like they. Don't they? No, like they used to. They, uh, that's all. That's all. Uh, now I know folks at their homes put the food scraps down the uh, the garbage disposal. But these uh, these uh, large institutions are governed by the wastewater treatment uh, facilities and no, like the inspector. How about the hospital. The hospital was always one of the biggest. No, they the hospital doesn't put any. Uh, any any food well, waste. How are they getting rid of it? They, they throw it away, and the hospital is going to be one of the is going to be one of the the largest providers in this new food scrap program. Yeah, they've been composting since April two thousand seven. The hospital. They've been on the pilot program. Well, they, they have. And yeah. how much how much you picking up there? Uh, what are well, we doing? Uh, I'm already saying they're doing three hundred pounds a day. Does that, that sound about right? At the hospital? Yeah. Well, I mean, I can't relate to you know that that's, far. That's about but. eight. Eight thirty-two gallon containers, half full, uh, three quarters full, three quarters. So it's like five or six barrels. Well, you know, I mean, it's hard for me to really, really yeah. relate to what we waste. picked up a day because, actually, we weren't see we weren't picking up the city at that time. So, but that's what the biggest. I always heard him talk about the amount of garbage that came from the St. Francis Hospital and the Cottage Hospital. You know, that was the biggest amount of garbage that would come out, you know, of even more so than the large hotels. Yeah. yeah. So well, you, it, 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 uh, no, you're exactly correct. You, you were not, we were not allowed to pick up in the city. No. As, as a matter of fact, it took us 55 years to, <laughs> to break into the city of Santa Barbara. That was a long wait. Yeah, and it couldn't go, you know, the city had their own. We just primarily worked around the county area. From the Rincon Point, which is a county line, it's Carmaria. We had all of Carmaria at one time until uh, now you're having it taken care of by Harrison's. But anyway, we had from, you know, all of that area, all of Montecito. Seen we bought, and as we went, I told you, you know, we had there was four other competitors, but one by one we bought them all out, because when they came in and the county put up the regulations, they didn't want to go to the extent, say, you know, and put your men in uniform, you know, and you have you have trucks, you're going to have to have covered over trucks, and so they said, oh, you know, so we bought them out. Mm -hmm. There was Otto Hopkins, there was P.I. Moulton, there was uh, Montecito American, which was De Lorenzi and Taverna, and uh, we bought them out. So that was in the 50s? Yeah. How many stops, how many actual customers did you have at that point? Well, I was, when I left, when uh, we separated in 1973, we started Marburg. And uh, prior to that, I used to do, I, I got out, not got out, but I was out on the field some, 
But I was doing the billing. I was running the billing machines, the IBM 402 accounting and billing machine where they had the punch cards. They said, well, I'm going to send you down to school for a week, two weeks, and you're going to run, I'm going to do the billing and all the accounting. So at that time, we had 10,000, right at 10,000 accounts, counting Carveria, Montecito, Hope Branch, Mission Canyon, Isla Vista. We had about, I would bill about 10,000 bills. You're saying this is when you incorporated Marburg in 73? And that's when I was still with... No, that was it, that was Channel. And then that, that's, what, what, what Channel Disposal Company. Yeah. And then w we saw an opportunity as the, there was growth in the area and there was more customers. Uh, and then uh, uh, Dad decided that uh, it was time. F you know, the families were getting big and. It was time to... Yeah, it was a time, so we split the company, and I... And split it in half, and... Yeah, I took the uh, west end of the, you know, from the city limits... All of Goleta. And all of Goleta, and Hope Branch, and Mission Canyon, and uh, which is still my brother and his son, they took Montecito and Carmen Rio. It was kind of a pretty much of an even split. The only the the difference was I remember was Mission Canyon, but we took the Mission Canyon and when we split it. But so at that time before the split, to answer your question, we were right at we were right at ten thousand accounts from from all from the whole area. And then when we came down here, so as far as counting. Because get back to that, you, they would count every bill, you know, so we knew what we were doing. But they said they, I didn't want to mess with that, so we didn't. We had it out how, you know, we had it done out. Our billing was done out, just like it is today, mm -hmm. you know. Anyway. Yeah. So, well, Dad, let me clarify that. We, we prepare the bills here. Oh, well, and yeah. Then, and then we forward the file at the end of the month, and, and the, the yeah. firm that does our billing now, with the exception of the city of Santa Barbara. They do, the city of Santa Barbara does the billing on the water bill. But uh, in our service area, we keep our own, uh, we keep our Well, own and then it came to that uh, when we started the roll-off business, it got to be so many transactions that we had to handle it more in-house yeah, again. We, 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 anyway. did, we did we did it, uh, we did it in-house, that's, mm -hmm. that's correct. So. BFI started collecting in the city of Santa Barbara in 73, right? 72, 73, that's, uh, about how you incorporated Marburg. Yeah, that, that's, that, that's, uh, yeah. I, yeah, I think BFI started in, uh, in 1970, in 1972. Okay. You see, there was a period of time there that uh, there was a company in Santa Barbara called PSNS. And they were mostly uh, Los Angeles investors, and uh, they had the contract for quite a while. And then uh, things went, uh, for the lack of a better description, the the city uh, the city booted them out, was declared them in default of the contract. And then the city of Santa Barbara ran the trash business in the city. For six months, they took over the trucks and everything. From they, the that was part of the settlement. They mm -hmm. took over the trucks. At that time, there was no containers, uh, although there was bins uh, for the restaurants and that thing. But the homes, everyone supplied their own cans. But uh, the city took uh, took over the the operation and employed the empl you know the employees were working for the city mm -hmm. and. Um, and then the city, uh, and then the city put it out to uh, put it yeah, out. You, yeah, and, 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 a, that and, was and, another and, story. And the and the city put it out to bid, and uh, at any rate, that was probably one of our was one of our biggest disappointments. Uh, well, the, 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 the bid the bid the bid process was basically well, right. flawed. We had the best bid. Well, that's right. Three dip times, the group that we put together. We had the best bid, but you know, with not words, there was 
there was shenanigans going on because every time they, they found something, well, we're going to bid over it. We had the best bid the first time, and we had the best bid the second time, but they kept lowering the price. And, and we, the third, and the third, third time, time, and the third time we didn't bid, and they lowered it again. Yeah, we said, "What the heck?" You know, they're talking about two dollars a month up here. You look up here in these hills. How it was impossible to do it? You well, know? They, they they couldn't do it, no. and as a result of that, there was a very very bitter strike, and there was. Uh, Fights, people were seriously hurt. Burning of uh, burning of vehicles. It, it was it was really a it was a nasty uh, situation to uh, to say the least. And they they so that just demonstrated right there that uh, you know basically we didn't take the bait. And uh, yeah. but at any rate, and uh, yeah, but it just way they know like a big company. Let's face it. They were in there a while, sure, but what in what no? They go to the city. We're not making money. They got to boost the rate. They got to boost. They got it up to where, to where it was profitable. Yeah. Well, yeah. and then they in time. But anyway, but, but that, at any that rate, was another. That that was another. Uh, yeah. Uh, but at any rate, yeah. after. Yeah. So here, so so here we are today. That's it. So let's go back in time again a little bit before sure. PSNS. When. Who was in the city before PSNS? Do you know? And when did that come Well, out? they had a man by the name of, well, there were two. It was Abbott and Hafferty. They, when the city first put it out, you know, for bid, because they wanted to clean up before this other, you know, there was a lot of haulers in there. And they wanted to put regulations and onto how it was going to be done. They had the first covered ore trucks, remember those covered ore trucks, and they put the regulations. And uh, they put it out that? they so put it out for a bid. Okay. That was in the 50s. Was that in the 50s? Early 50s? Or before the uh, early 50s. Or it must have been early 50s. It must have been because let's see when when Tavernas came out to Montecito no, told us so before that, before the war, because when they were, the Tavernas were had all the city, and then remember they came out and started to go on mission can. That was in the 30s. Oh, yeah, that was before. Well, wasn't, 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 wasn't Abbott the mayor? He left. It was Abbott an hour later, but that was, that was later on he became mayor. I guess he was the same one. Well, that's, but I bet you, if they look back at the records, it was Abbott and Hafferty. Well, that that was the same. I mean, I haven't searched the archives, anyway, but I mean, the word has. And it was it was uh, it was in the it was before the war. In the thirties, because I remember going up to Pichoni's up there to dump, and Lino had started. Uh, they started a, a route in Mission Canyon, and uh, that's when they, the that's city. When the Tavernas had the city. Well, the Taverna, the Taverna family was one of the originals going back to, actually, they say they were started doing with horse and wagon. They lived there on Olive Street. Yeah. It was in the teens or? And that, that, that was, then? that was an early, uh, you know, in the early 1900s. Yeah, they were Tavernas, and then they had their cousins at uh, Raffetto's. And then, of course, they were, when the city decided that they were going to franchise it, you know, just put them out. You know, they didn't want to, I guess, get into the new equip type of equipment and everything. And uh, so, uh, this so, so the city went with the Abbots in the fifties. Yeah, in the fifties. Abbott and Hafferty. Sure, yeah. Abbott and Hafferty. He's sure. a former mayor. I, I think I don't know if he was or not, but I know that's who started the garbage company. Actually, Providello's backed him up to buy the trucks and get going. So they were in place servicing the city until what? The early '60s until PSNS. That's right, PSNS. Yeah, yeah. P P PSNS came along. They were a group of, of, of primarily uh, investors from. Uh, they from have West, from investors from Los the way they got in because they put investors from Santa Barbara too that was able to get their their hooks in there to know the right oh, people. I understand what you're saying. So here's a question for both of you: How do you think the waste? stream has changed 
since the 20s and 30s to today. What's different about the waste stream? Well, I think you have more waste because we didn't have all this, these containers, everything, containers that we have today. You know, you have, uh, you know, when frozen foods came out, you know, you can everything, so many, you had cans and bottles, yes, but you didn't have all this, all this container, containerized foods. Oh, you know, I mean, you had cereals and everything, but I think there's a, there's a more, more waste comes in the waste stream than, uh, don't you think there is? Oh, without a doubt, for example, the milk. Uh, yeah, that, the, that's right, a the, milk the milk, when, uh, when the milk. Uh, <laughs> that's right. The milk bottles, there was no milk cartons, there was milk bottles. You had and your, those milk you bottles. You delivered your milk, you know. You take a family that used four quarts of milk a day, you know, they had two half gallons, you know. That's that was one of the primarily things, you know, right? That that, that that was one of the big ones, and the whole packaging. Uh, and uh, then the bottles. Is, sure, you take like the, your your Coke. That's where we used to save bottles. Hey, that was a deal. You save the Coke bottles, then Pepsi bottles, Canada Dry bottles, and then everything came canned, throwaway, you know. And they weren't aluminum to begin with, you know, beer. Beer started, I remember, when Pat's Blue Ribbon came out with the first beer cans, and they were, and, you know, they were metal cans, they weren't, uh, so they were all thrown away. You know, before, boy, you, you saved all those, uh, that was a deal, is to save the, when people threw away their Coke bottles, hey, that's a nickel, you know, you saved, and then they had the big ones, you know, that's 10 cents, knee high. Then it came to throwaways, things, everything, you know, came throwaway. But basically, I, I, I think that uh, we have really came, we have really came full circle. Where it was in, uh, obviously, I wasn't here in the, in the 30s, uh, but, you know, I was riding around with Dad when I was just a little kid. And you know we used to save the bottles and everything. So I, my memory is 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 pretty good in the when we're starting in the early 50s, and I can just visualize it that we today are basically making a full circle and coming back to where we were. It's just a different methodology in place today. For example, you have the bottle bill today, as before we used to save the bottles and uh, take them to the grocery stores uh, for, uh, for redemption. And uh, uh, we used to save the lettuce crates. Remember oh, the, yeah, uh, I used the, to get, yeah, sure, the guy the, used to the buy lettuce, the lettuce crates. From the produce, uh, from the restaurants, from yeah. the, in fact, the, oh, the yeah. uh, Miramar was one of our you, favorites. You used to, save, used to save the gallon cans. And we used to save the potato sacks, the, 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 the sacks. Yeah. And we used to save the gallon cans. The gallon cans of nurseries, instead of using plastic like they use now, they used to use the gallon cans. And boy, they're, they're not the premium, but you, you save the gallon cans from these hotels that the gallon, tin gallon cans came in. And they, they used to fit inside of those crates. So they now we're back for you, or you, would you? We'd sell them, sell you know. Them. You know, they'd, send, they'd be a fellow come around and buy them because then he in turn would sell them to the nursery. They would dip them in that uh, saving stuff there, that tar stuff, or whatever, but uh, save that one. I, I used to save enough bottles to every time on the route because I used to smoke, you know, and I'd buy my cigarettes. I used to like cigars, and I'd go down to the store there in Carpentry on the way back from the dump, and. Buy he, a box of White Owl cigars. And he wouldn't take money, but he could bring the bottles and you could take anything you want. You know? So I used to smoke a pack and half a day and smoke cigars. And, but anyway, we yeah. saved. And soda pop, hey, you, 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 baby Ruth candy bars. Yeah, that's great. You're going on 92? 90, uh, yeah, I'm going to 92. You're going on 92. In 91 now. Wow. 1918. Yeah, I started going with my brother, I think I was about 10 years old, picking up. First started on, which is now Casa de Rinda, the Robert Bliss estate. Yeah, the main house, and the, and the chauffeur's cottage, 
chauffeur house, then a head gardener house, then a housekeeper's house. Anyway, that's where he started. Picking up bottles? No, picking up garbage. That was garbage then? That's okay. all. Okay. He didn't pick up no cans, no nothing. Just picked up the garbage, fed it to some hogs. Yeah. Dad, Dad comes down here, uh, he sticks his head in every day, maybe not every day, but a lot of times, and I'll say to him, uh, well, how you doing today? He says, well, I didn't sleep very good last night. And I said, why didn't you sleep? Well, he said, I was having a dream, he says, and uh, just retracing my old routes. Yeah, so I you can take him out today, and he dreams all the time. I can go that route. He From knows when his I routes. Started and Monday then... and Wednesday and Friday, Saturday. Yeah, there was no days off. So he's still dreaming about his old routes of yeah. 50 years ago. That's really yeah. Hey, no. Mr. Go ahead. You go on. Uh, <laughs> you go to Monday, you know, on the Monday, and go to these places, and go ahead and start. And mostly, I'm not saying we didn't pick up from small places, but you know, you picked up from the bigger places. And man, I, you know, you started from from Naps and come down to Parmas and Ryerson and Doctor Douglas. I mean, it took took us about an hour and a half or so to pick up about six places. I mean, in this place, instead of having cans for their flowers that came out of the house and their paper, they, they had box, they have a big box, wooden box. Doors would open in the front. And just like, it'd be similar to a, your boxes today. You'd put a canvas down in the front, open up the doors, you know, it, it was, you stayed, you picked up, you didn't get go in and out, you know, maybe it took you 15 minutes, you know, to pick up a place, you know, but the route. Well, and a bigger one that had the same, uh, uh, remember when we used to pick up the Miramar? I can remember oh, that as Miramar plain as day. A, oh, I'm not, the Biltmore, the Biltmore, excuse Biltmore, me, the yeah, Biltmore had a box, well, it must have been about yeah, eight, hell, eight yeah. feet long, and it was high, and it, it had doors that opened from the front and it had a hinge door on the top and uh, we'd have to cl we'd have to clean out that uh, yeah they just, just throw the stuff in there. not the garbage they didn't put the garbage in there but they put all, all of the papers. all of the waste from the from the rooms and they put it in there and we'd have to clean yeah, that stuff clean up and day. then after you clean that out you'd have to throw it over the top of the truck oh well sure and if is. you didn't have a top man we'd have to jump up on the side of the truck empty your box out and uh, yeah, there was there was uh, the Biltmore. The Biltmore was one of the was one of the oh, yeah, the yeah, Biltmore yeah. was one Biltmore. of the Biltmore. And those cans in that room were so were so darn heavy, full of garbage. Oh, yeah, yeah. So tell me what you remember: paper, bottles, cans. What was the whole What was the whole waste stream that you were emptying out of those boxes? What do well, you remember? Well, for example, at the at the built um, at the Biltmore. There was a lot of newspaper in that, uh, in the, in the big box from the rooms, and there was a lot of there, there was a lot of uh, uh, beverage containers uh, as well, and uh, it was newspaper, Kleenex, all that stuff, and you 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 you'd have to we'd have to pick that stuff up by hand. So no packaging though, right? No frozen dinner packaging or no, no, no like no. now Cereal you know boxes. from the motel rooms you know people take a pizza in their room or stuff like no there was none of that. no none, none of that, that. No, none no, of that. No, no there was none of that seems uh, like I think like you keep saying newspaper I remember too because I think you know every room probably had a newspaper you know what I mean but uh, well maybe had uh, two or three of them maybe had yeah, the but, the, uh, the, uh, anyway. the new Santa Barbara News Press and the, in the New top. York Times and the Wall Street Journal. No, you get down the way, what it basically, isn't it the same thing that come out of these, you know what I mean, and, uh, the use of the the same things, you know? Yeah, it's the, essentially, now we have packaging. That's right, that's essentially, essentially, you know. Yeah. And that's where you get more, because as we said before, people got packaged, and it, it, like you said, was a good example that, the milk cartons here you went with as a family, hell, I mean, that'd be, have a can, you know, half a gallon milk cartons, you know, before the milkman came to your door every day and they, 
You left the bed, picked up your empties, and left your milk. Mm -hmm. I remember the heck the, the milkman in, in uh, Montecito. Boy, that was a live oak dairy, and live that was quite a thing for these milkmen, you know, because uh, the the customers that they would have it be in a lot of those places. They're again a milk. I know those places would make their own ice cream. So you know they they leave maybe a couple of quarts of cream, you know. So uh, these big households, I mean, you take, you know, by the time they had a cook and they had a second, the, the lady cook, the man, mostly ladies that I remember, but then the, she always had to help, help her. You know, they had a butler. Some of them had a second butler because the main butler, all he did was wait the food on the, 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 the main people, you know. And then they had a maids, and then the second maid, there'd be eight or ten people that just working in the house. You'd get that, that uh, recyclable, you know, food scraps from them, you know, plus, plus the, the people themselves, you know. They, there, was, there was some big, well, there's big places out there. Yeah. I have two questions. One, if the barrels came into the yard full of food scraps, they must have weighed 250 pounds each. How did you empty those at the pig farm? Okay, that's a good question, but I maybe that's why my back bothers. But anyway, we drove, okay, the, we fed on cement platforms, and uh, we're, we're, we drove in here, and the hogs, the platform, were down here. Drive alongside of them, and not pull over the 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 fifty gallon brand. Had it dumped over the side, picked it up, and dumped it down. Just like would knock it over, and it would empty out. Well, yeah. Just knock yeah. It over. Oh, yeah. 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 You want to be damn careful. Sometime you lose it, and if it got away from you, then it, you know, it, you get down there, and you had to go down there and pick it up. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. And that that was. And I must say, there was a knack to it, you know, you, I could pick them over and, you know, you could roll it at the end, you know. Well, the yeah. part that I can remember about it was, the secret to it was when you wanted to make sure that you at least kept three quarters of the barrel on the truck. Oh, that's, and, that's right. Because exactly. it, it, would, it, would, it would cantilever if you dumped half, yeah, if, you dumped, if you dumped half or even a little less than half, the weight of it would take it over. Would oh, yes. would take it over, so you yeah. had to make sure that uh, uh, there there was a little math involved in it. And then yeah. I, I had about three or four different places. I had the main place where I used to feed, and then the thing was you kept the hogs uh, in different pen, different sizes, and always wanted to give as much as they wanted, and say the the better of the food to the hogs that you were getting ready to market. Then after they got through eating, then you chased them out and you let the other ones come in and clean it up. And I will say after, we always had enough hogs to eat. When they got through, it would be just like this. All that would be left would be silverware and some big bones that they couldn't handle eating. You'd even there in the mornings, you'd go there, if you'd, if they happened to feed prunes at the marine base, you'd hear the crack, crack. The hogs would actually crack the seeds and get the inside of them. Wow. You know? And it would just be just be clean like that. You never, you know. Yeah. As far as cleaning up after, and the hogs, you know, they're hogs, they're hogs, but they never, they never disposed of their own they, where they ate the food. They always went out. You know, you say, well, animals, you know, and they, uh, as far as uh, that, they were clean. So the other question I had is, when did you stop doing the pig farm, and, and well, why? Well, when the it stopped, stopped because doing we garbage? stopped doing it, we kept on doing it. What was it? It was in, in the '60s, because you had to start to cook your food. You have to cook the garbage in order to feed it to hogs. The new regulations. The new regulations, because the disease were transmitted in pork, they would ship hogs that were probably diseased. 
and uh, would be in the fat and the trimmings. And so they said that was being transmitted to your your healthy hogs that were eating, and if so they put the regulations that you had to cook the garbage. So then everybody probably stopped doing. Well, hogs. we did it. We did it for a while. We had a, was it about this long that that uh, it, it, it was yeah, it was longer than that, Dad. That, that the one an old gasoline we cut two thirds of it off. We put it, it, cradled it in, and it had diesel. It was a diesel-fired diesel blower, fired. And, blower yeah. and then you'd have to uh, yeah. Yeah. bring it up to yeah. a certain temperature and boil it, and then uh, yeah. you'd obviously have to let it cool, and then you'd... And uh, you better have done it, too, because you never knew when the expect inspector would come along and check you out, mm -hmm. you know. And if you did, well, boy, it, he'd go, uh, well, come along, but he'd come after the cooling down and say, well, you didn't get that cooked. Well, you didn't come, you know, that s not soon enough. But anyway, they, they checked you out. And that's when it got to be a hassle. How many years did you do that? Were you we didn't cooked? do that for, what, two or three years. Remember, we yeah, it, was, it wasn't that long. No, it wasn't that long. In the 60s? Yeah. So you had a Packer truck running and you had a separate route doing garbage? Yeah. Well, no, we no, no, not in the '60s. No, we, we, we didn't. There was there was no hogs. There was no hogs in the '60s. No. As, a, as a matter of fact, uh, the, the, the the ranch was sold in order to uh, to start to buy this uh, these new compactor type trucks. That's when the ranch. No, right. That's that's when the ranch was yeah, sold. We sold it in in two. They sold half in two five acre parcels. Mm -hmm. We bought that thirty. We bought that ten acres for I think it was thirty-two hundred dollars, and we sold the ten acres for fifty-five thousand. Was there capital gains taxes back then? Huh? Was there capital gains taxes back then? No, there was no capital gains. You just reinvested the money. You didn't save it anyway. <laughs> you put it back to work, and the, yeah, that's what kept the economy going. Yeah. Do you remember how much? How much did you charge early on for picking up people's garbage? Okay, these places like these biggest states, like I say, the two best customers we had, T.C. Walker paid fifteen dollars a month, four days a week, eight dollars for their beach house. That was the best stop we had. That was that was a twenty twenty two dollars, wasn't it? Twenty three dollars a month. T.C. Walker, Mr. T.C. Walker, was the grandson of Polk and Talbot Steamship and Lumber Company from San Francisco. He moved down here. And then Mrs. Slater, they, I, we had to go there every day, and uh, they paid $15 a month, but they didn't have much trash. McCormick Estate paid $15 a month. But normally these places were paying $10 a month for three times a week service. You took everything. Five dollars a month. If you, we had some ordinary working people. They paid a dollar a month. They had a once a week service, dollar a month. Two dollars a month for twice a week service. I'll never forget when we were, they, the county, when they let us raise, we raised two dollars and 27 cents for for uh, twice a week, but that was a normal rate. And then as time went on, then twice a week got to be three dollars a month. But the, the right down at the lowest was a dollar a month for once a week. So we had a once a week service. Do you remember who your first employee was? Oh yeah, Harry Coda. He, my brother hired Harry Coda, was a neighbor. And uh, I was uh, going to Santa Barbara Junior High in 1932. Harry was a year older. He didn't go to school anymore, so Harry was 15 years old, and he used to go with my brother. And he worked for us until he retired. There, he, he went in the service. He got shot up. But anyway, he came back, and he still worked for us, remember? And he, he passed away here. 20 years ago. When, huh? when he used to 20. sit, huh? Yeah, 20, more yeah. than 20 years ago. Yeah, we had Harry Coda, and then we had Richard Lamke. Richard Lamke started working for, for us 
when he was still going to high school, and uh, he came from a family of 12 children anyway, really. My brother gave him a job just to run the, his house and around the, kept our trucks. And he, he worked for us all the way through, started after he got it. He went to Catholic High. He graduated from high school, started, kept working for us, went in the service, went in the, and because uh, Korean conflict came back, Never worked for anybody else but the Borgatellos. And lo and behold, sure got shortchanged. He retired at 65. The boys, he retired at 62, but in order to get his, uh, his uh, medic, Medicare till 65, they let him work, remember, two days a week to take the route over here at the hill. And he... Uh, and anyway, his last route was uh, was the Cuyama route. Cuyama, the last route was a Cuyama route. He'd go out there, and he had got a something went wrong with the kidneys, and he was on dialysis. And I remember one of the last times he stopped by the place here, and he just came back from dialysis. But three or four days, he passed away, just in his early seventies. That was the oldest Rich, boy. Richard Lamping. Wonderful guy. Yeah. What I never missed a day's work was rain or shine or whatever. He always came to work with those open trucks. He always, right to the last man to work on an open truck and by himself. No, I don't need a helper. He had the Hope Ranch route. Never got a complaint over there. If we had a complaint, he'd say, my sister that worked for us and then Laura, to Richard, something about her left a can or something. I didn't leave a can. Don't worry, I'll take care of it. He'd take care of it the next. Anyway, that's the kind of employee we had. We, are, we I will say we have to say our employees really stayed with us a long time. You know, we always figure we gave them a good salary. We always started out with the benefits. To this day, we always. When he came, we had a medical forum, retirement forum, which yeah. we have this day. That's why, just one other word, I think that's why the union never was able to get in here because the fellas had all the benefits that the union could afford to give them. Yeah, in that regard, I was just going to say, what do you guys think makes Marboard unique? Well, like what you just said, that's what distinguishes you from the unionized larger companies. Right. What else makes Marboard? Look at the uh, channel was there. They went unionized. They were unionized six months or so. Well, they had a better deal when they were with Channel, and they so they're one of the few companies that broke away from the union. And then they had a heck of a time getting on, getting out of the union after they got into the union. I, yeah. Stephen, I, I think uh, is what really makes Marboard unique. Number one, we are a family business. And I don't think that there's any stronger business than a family business providing the family sticks together. And that's what me and dad and my brother and... Uh, my son's son-in-law, my niece, and uh, that that's what makes us unique. And, and in the fact that we have a lot of young people coming up uh, uh, behind me and David that are capable, understand solid waste business, and Brian is a recycling freak, as you know. I don't want to call him a freak, but uh, he's, he's just, he's the one that designed that facility over there and that's what makes us unique that we've made the transition from a trash hauler to being a recycler as well and that's what uh, is makes us unique and uh, and going into the future will continue to make us t to set us aside because not everybody wants to go spend a lot of money uh, like like we have in infrastructure and uh, it's easy to be just a collection company today that's easy that's the easy part but uh, it's 
what do we do with the material after and uh, and plus all the men and women that work for Marburg uh, are wonderful wonderful people and uh, we treat them well. well they always and treated we, them right you know, and, and we you know we expect an, an honest we expect an honest day's work and uh, because it's it's yeah. a two-way street and uh, I think those are the things that set Marburg aside. Well, I also think uh, Anique, too, is a bit of service. Uh, I've always, uh, not always, when we first boys came aboard, uh, instilled upon them to give you give the service. You know, even though, even though you were a, a franchise, e, you know, you still have to give the service. If you don't, well, you have the people in the county. You know, get out. But because when we had the competition like we had, when I grew up and started, if you didn't give the service, like I mentioned before, if the people wanted you to go up in the in the back inside of the back porch of there to get their cans, you know, or line their cans, if you didn't give the service, somebody else would stop in, you know, would step in to do it. You know, and we, we had a competition at one time, uh, uh, Mr. Otto Hopkins, he was an African-American, he was a good man, I mean, fine man, but in order to get started, well, he went to the people and said, I'll wash your car once a week, so help me, if I get your business, and he got, he got service. Some people would know, you know, I'm happy with who I have, but the competition may make you, you know, to be what you are, and I, you know, try to instill, you know, you, you have to give the service. You know, if you don't give the service, you're not going to be around very long. And I think that's what's made this company, you know, like it is, you know. We had my sister that worked in the office there, and she retired at 80, Laura, and she really is to handle, you know what I mean, like it was, uh, she wasn't uh, in it as far as financially, but she was treated not only as family, as a really a valued employee, but she used to get so perturbed and upset and mad when some people on the phone would call up, you know, and say, well, they left my can today, you know, they left and she said, she'd, uh, or, uh, you know, well, maybe it was, was too heavy. Oh, those stupid Mexicans says, what do you mean, my 11-year-old kid, you know, and that used to get her so upset. But that's how the people, you know, some of the people would be. They'd have no understanding, but she was was so, with the, the company, or the service or something, well, we'll take care of it. From that way on, on through the service that we provided, I think was one of the main reasons why, you know, well, and we, we, we've carried the service philosophy, um, for example, uh, there is, in the, in the roll-off business, we have competition. And the records speak for themselves, and uh, our competitors all know it, so... Uh, uh, it really doesn't bother me which viewer is watching or listening to this. I mean, we have 85% of the roll-off business in the, in the entire Santa Barbara County. Now, I don't know what the city stats are, but I would assume we probably are. So there's competition there, and we still have not the lion's share. We have just about all of it. And it is because of service. We treat whether a person is part of a franchise agreement where nobody else can come in and serve or whether somebody else can do it. We treat the, the, the customers in that, uh, in that manner. So Dad, is, w with his, uh, you know, Dad taught us whether you have a f franchise or whether you don't. Because when you have franchises, some people have a tendency to get sloppy because they say, well, nobody else can come in and do it, and to put me in default of our contract, that's going to be a, a big, long uh, legal 
and the jurisdictions aren't going to want to spend the money. So they, they know they have some leverage, but we don't care whether we have a franchise or not. That, 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 we're, we're out there giving the, the same type of service, and I think that is clearly illustrated by the example I gave you with the, with the fact that we have most of most of the roll-off business, and that's the reason why. Not because our uh, containers are beige or one other company may have another color or whatever else. And we have one more minute. Yeah. Can you guys tell me what you think is the, what the future holds? We have one, one or two minutes, and then we're, we're out the, of tape. The, the, the future, the, 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 the industry has changed. There's no question about it. But the future holds, uh, was your question explicitly for Marburg what Industry? What is the future, yeah. Uh, the, 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 I know what our future is because we're not going any place. We've got young people coming up, and uh, it, it's going to be Marburg Industries. And uh, we're going to continue to forge ahead and uh, seize on opportunities and, uh, and, uh, and grow the business where we see it uh, appropriate. How about the waste industry in, in general? The waste industry in general, I, I, that's a whole other question, but I'm very disappointed with the way the waste industry has gone, and it's, uh, they're multi-billion dollar companies.